So here I'm just showing you how I'm preparing uh, my hoop for the crystal application. We'll show you that on the machine as well. But before I do that, just want to show you something way cute. This is um, by a company called Options. It's a portable bead and embellishing tower. And it looks like the part number is 700-704. The reason why I'm showing you this is, first of all, way cute. We always like way cute things. But also, if I open this up, everyone go, ooh, ah, you can see how there are these little um, compartments. And inside each of these little compartments are this uh, Rolodex of fun. Uh, and so in each of these little guys, you'll see that there are some beautiful crystals. Everyone go, ooh, ah. Uh, these are like the yellow ones, and they've got, you know, all different types of colors that you can get. But, you know, this is a storage container. It doesn't necessarily, it doesn't come with these. It's just the empty, it, it would look like this, of course, if you bought it, right? Um, but you fill it up with crystals, and then that way, when you're boogieing with the crystals, and you want different sizes, different colors, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to find them. And a plus, once again, it was way cute. So, uh, again, the company is called uh, Options, and that's something to consider. Um, when you get crystals, generally speaking, um, they'll come in little packets like this. Uh, and so I'm going to be using the Crystal Work tool. The, um, the template that I made consists of both size 10 and size 6 crystals. The reason why I use size 6 is um, when, I when I created the multiple flowers, we'll talk about that during class, uh, so I can have multiple uses for this template. The smallest one I created was a 1 inch uh, diameter flower, and that was a little too small for the 10 um, 10 crystal, size 10 crystal. So we're using size 6 for um, for the smallest flower, but for everything else, it's a size 10. Um, <clears throat> and in the software, you'll see that like a size 6 is, I don't know, something like 1.5 to 2 millimeters. I think the largest one, which is a size 16, is getting you up to like 4 millimeters, 5 millimeters. So the crystals are not huge, but we can cut anything from um, a crystal that is a couple of millimeters with this die and plate set to one that's approximately four millimeters and that would be using this die and place set and I'll show you how we put that on the machine shortly. The majority of my template is cut out with a size uh, 10 and so you can see here um, that it does say, let me see if I can get the get it up close you know, it's a size 10. Each of the plates will say what size they are. So if you mix them up as far as in the compartment, uh, there, there's no harm, no foul. Um, with this little guy here, you do want to align this. There is inside here, I'm getting, I'm trying to get close here, like a big tab and a small tab. This is an opening. This thing here is like a little opening where when you need to take this thing off, or I use uh, a really complex tool called a paper clip and I'll just get it in there and pry the plate off so I can dump the uh, chads that were punched out um, um, easier. This is kind of, this is magnetized. You can kind of see how it's magnetized there. So once you have this in place, it's, it grips what you want it to do because this is going to be underneath your your sewing needle, right? And so you don't want anything like this coming off during the process of of punching out a, a plate. So <clears throat> there is all of that. And I'll put that on the machine. I'll bring you over in just a sec. So we talked a little bit about crystals. Let me talk also about the supplies. So when you make a template, you're going to be using uh, a template material similar to this. Let me bring the camera down just a bit. Yeah, similar to this. If you notice, I drew with a Sharpie marker where I wanted to cut this with a scissor. I can certainly use this material for smaller templates, so I don't throw this stuff out. I just cut what I need. And then I also mark the center point of that area so that when I align my, um, my punched uh, crystal template, I get it to the center of the material. In addition to that, you want some type of backing board. This um, this is going to be a perfect size. These come in like six inch squares, 
I think I got this at like a Hobby Lobby type of place, etc. It just needs to be a, a piece of fairly stiff cardboard. Um, sometimes you'll get the template material, um, um, I should say the backing board, in larger sheets. And then you're going to need to cut those. And I generally use, um, not fabric scissors, but you know, some like a utility scissor. I mark out the dimensions, similar to what I just did with this template material, which I will cut out. Uh, before putting it on the hoop, um, but this is just convenient in that it is already cut to the size that I need, so yay. And then last but not least, this is the um, release or transfer paper, I should say. There's a bubbly um, side here. This is uh, the retaining paper. This can be reused once you peel this off transfer the crystals, you can put it back on this sheet and use the same piece of transfer tape multiple times, which is nice. So that's the materials that go on top of the hoop. What goes in the hoop would be um, freezer paper. And this is a roll that I've had for, I'm going to say, at least nine years. And I haven't gotten through it yet. Um, I use this for multiple things as far as uh, freezer paper, piecing, that type of thing. But it also, this, which has a, like a shiny waxed side versus the doll side, um, this is very good for releasing the template material once you finish punching it. Um, you could also use like baking parchment paper, same thing, um, only different. So this is my medium size hoop. If you notice, the difference here is I took the outer hoop <clears throat> off of the inner hoop, I put the freezer paper down, and then I put the outer hoop on top of the inner hoop. This is reverse of how we normally hoop fabric. Generally, the outer hoop is underneath the fabric. We take the inner hoop and we push it through, and so it's hooped in reverse. But this, you actually want it to be hooped like this, because this gives you this important clearance that the little bucket that I showed you with the little disc in it, this rides underneath here. So that's why we hoop it in this fashion. I then take scissors and I just cut away anything that might interfere with, this is how your machine knows what hoop you have on these little fingers here. So I don't want paper or anything around that. And I just kind of prettied, prettied it up a little bit for the camera. So those are the uh, main materials that will go into cutting out the template. So next we'll take you over to the machine. So here I have on the machine um, the foot 48, the, um, the stylus for size 10 crystal, the plate for size 10 crystal, and the bucket. Um, one thing that you always want to do when you are uh, beginning a crystal work design is take the hand wheel and make sure that where you have that placed is, you see how it's, it's going through the hole fine? It's not hitting anything. That's important to just double check that. Uh, don't presume that it's where it needs to be. Uh, what I have had happen to me, again, this is magnetic, so it kind of takes a little oomph to get it um, off. You see there's like a little peg here on the bottom of this. That's the only protrusion that you have. It's very easy to think you're in the right place and you have it in one of the tracks where the feed teeth are. You want to actually be in the sew hole, sew hole of the stitch plate. So the peg goes into the hole, which should align with the peg up here. So that should align with this. So when I put this on, I kind of, if you see how there's like a lot of movement here, that's not in the right place. I can tell you that right now. So let me get this thing back off. And that's in the right place. Why? Because you see as, as I move this, it's not wiggling around. If it's wiggling around, you're not in the right place. And again, always lower the foot to make sure it's going into that hole. Very important, very important. Um, so that takes care of that. I'm just gonna put on the hoop and you can see that the template material has been stuck, stuck to the uh, freezer paper. What I wanted to show you is um, a function. Let me go up onto the screen. I do this as well. Um, this is the check placement uh, tool. 
Uh, notice a lot of these icons for, I'm in the editing screen of our Bernina machine. A lot of these things are um, grayed out, like you can't rotate, you can't resize, you can't mirror image. The only thing you can do is, in essence, you can take the whole design, uh, move it left, right, up, down, but no resizing, no rotation, no mirroring of a design works design. All of that must be done, must be done in the software. And again, as I'd mentioned in prior lessons, when you're designing in DesignWorks, it's really important that you pay attention to A, the uh, foot you have on the machine. In other words, is it a paintwork tool versus an embroidery foot 26? Um, and also what hoop you are using. Uh, because if something's out of the field, when you go into the machine, it's out of the field. It's, it's designed too big for that particular hoop. And again, you can't resize. So just keep that in mind. So what I'm going to do is, uh, again, I'm going to this check function. And so when I click here, you just heard that the hoop moved. And as I'm going to do this on the screen, but I'm going to show you the hoop. But you can see these little four arrows, you know, upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right, and also the uh, center of the design. So I'm going to come back down here. I don't really care about if it's perfectly centered. It's not like I'm aligning this template to another object. If it was embroidery, it would be a different story. This is an embroidery. This is just cutting out the template for the flower. So I'm in the upper left hand corner. Let me go to the upper right. And what I'm doing is I'm just making sure that the, um, the cutting tool is not at the perimeter of the template material. And that looks good. I've got at least half an inch around that. Coming down here, that looks perfect. Let me come over to this side here. That looks perfect. The only thing I might want to do, I'm going to keep you on the screen here, uh, on the hoop here. Uh, I'm going to go come back into um, the editing function. And what I might want to do is I might want to move the design uh, maybe down just a little bit. So I'm going to come down just a little bit. Nothing, nothing too crazy. I'm going to uh, come back here. It's just that it was favoring the top of the template. Um, it was still, it was still fine, but I just want it to be just a little bit more centered. I'm going back to the check function. That looks groovy. That looks fabu. That looks wunderbar. And alles ist prima. So here we have uh, what we need to um, to do before again we cut out a template. I'm going to take you back to the screen because there's another thing I want to show you. Most of your templates, uh, I shouldn't say it that way, um, my experience has been the majority of the templates that I have made have been using one size of crystal. There can be exceptions to that and this is one of the exceptions. When I was designing this little design here, um, what I found was, uh, let me go out of here, and I'm going to go into the sewing side of things, or stitching out, cutting side of things. What I found was the little, the little star in this flower in the center at one inch was a little too big. It was a little too big. Um, uh, I'm sorry. The crystals, size 10 crystals, were a little too big for a design that was this small. As a consequence, Everything else that I'm cutting, except for this, which is stitching out or cutting out first, this next flower, this flower, and this circle, these are all um, cut with a uh, 10 die. And that's the size that I have in the machine now. How do I know that I'm cutting with a 6? Because I designed it in software. But also, do you see here where it says SS6, SS6? Let me zoom in here just a bit. So see how it says SS6? So that's telling me that's the, the color of the crystal, 369, and it's SS6. If I go to the next part of this design, do you see how this is size 10, SS10? This next one is SS10. The next one is SS10. So if I'm going to, and I am, going to cut this out, doesn't it make sense to say yes, that I should start with the second color, cut out all of that, 
cut out the next flower, cut out the circle, and then before I leave the screen, I'll go back to one, and I'm just going to change out the die and the uh, plate <coughs> to a size six, and then cut out that last part of the crystal. So all that being said, uh, let me go out just a little bit here. And what you're going to see here, <coughs> I have a 9 millimeter plate indicated on this machine. And that's not what I have on it. I have the cut work plate. So I'm going to come over here and tell it I've got the cut work plate. There's no sensor on your machine, so you can have the wrong plate on. And it will still let you cut. <coughs> but if you go and have, say, a straight stitch plate on your machine, and you don't tell the machine that you have that, when you go to stitch something else out, let's just say you're making clothing, the machine doesn't know it doesn't have a 5.5 or a 9 millimeter plate on, so you will break a needle. So it's always best to just be honest with the machine and tell it when you're putting a new plate on what plate that is. Also on here, this is the foot that I'm using. When I click on the screen, do you see how it is saying, yes, I understand you're doing a crystal work design, and you see how the recommended foot with the little gold star is the foot 48. And so I make sure that it knows that that's the case as well. With more complex designs, what will happen is the machine will stop periodically and remind you that it's time to, um, to empty the little bucket of the little template materials. So I'm going to come down here. This makes an interesting sound, so don't be too alarmed. Um, it is what it is. And I'm going to go ahead and let this begin so you can see how this is cutting out. And so... cuts a lot quicker than like a silhouette or other machines where you can actually cut different uh, templates out of uh, and it also cuts them more cleanly uh, so I'm not generally picking out chads this is just just comes to the next color so I'm just going to tell it to go ahead again why do I do this um, well, I might want to put crystals just like what you're seeing here, maybe a couple of echoing crystals. But also, from a single template, I can have several different uses for it. The last thing I'm going to cut with this is going to be the little um, circle up at the top. That's for the center of the flower. So you saw how quick this thing does, uh, which is truly amazing. I'm going to go ahead and take this hoop off. And you can see it does a, a pretty good job in cutting out the templates, which is nice. The other thing I'm going to do is just show you, you can see some of the uh, chads that are up on the top here. I'm going to go ahead and take this thing off at Magnet Strong for a reason. I'm going to now go ahead and open this thing up with the end of a paper clip. And what, what you're going to need to do is have some more light, uh, yeah, is just empty these things out in a trash can and then you can continue to cut. I'm going to off camera just cut that little tiny uh, little flower in the center. Uh, I just want you to see how this is working and I'll be right back. So I have, I have you over here at the ironing board because um, I cut a piece of vinyl. Uh, I'm looking at how I'm going to make the uh, flower element that will applique to the uh, bag. And this vinyl I've had in my collection for a while, it's very cute. Um, it's kind of an alligator textured type of thing here. <clears throat> I used some uh, metallic pens on this and um, I, I painted there, let it dry for a little bit, then took my finger and pushed and I think you can probably see how it kind of smudged which might be the effect that you want, but I don't want that. So some of the inks, depending on the surface, how absorbent the surface is, uh, fabric not so much, but specifically uh, vinyls, um, they will tend to resist um, 
the um, the application uh, it won't soak in as well as we would like and so what you would need to do is again you see here I drew uh, I drew three lines right and I took a <clears throat> piece of um, um, oh what is this um, like an, an applique sheet, uh, Teflon sheet. Yeah, that, that's a good word, Teflon sheet. And I put the uh, ink um, underneath the Teflon sheet, and then I took an iron, and this is important when you're using the iron. This iron is set for like a, just a little bit above synthetic because, I den again, I don't want to go full tilt boogie with a really, really hot iron because, again, this is plastic. That wouldn't be cool. So if it would melt, unless that's the effect you're going through, but not today. So um, I just had it on a synthetic setting. I put the uh, Teflon sheet over it. I pressed and held for like a good 10 Mississippi, let go, let it dry or let it cool I should say. And then I took my finger and as you can see here on camera I'm wiping it down and it's not traveling. So that that sets the ink. And so again depending on the surfaces that you're using you definitely want to test before applying it to a project. Now for today's project I'm going to be using um, this piece of uh, cork fabric that uh, I showed you a couple of lessons back that I didn't want to cut into it. This is the actual cork fabric, which is which is very lovely, um, but it's relatively costly. You know, it, it, everything's relative, right? And as you can see here, I'm going to kind of come down here and let me zoom in just a little bit. I used um, I used a Fabrico marker, so this is the Fabrico. I love these because there is, it's a dual marker. These work really well with the paintwork tool. You've got one side here that's kind of a bullet end, so it's for a uh, thicker drawing. And then you've got a finer end here where the nib is a little smaller, as you can see here. So um, these are really, really nice to use in the, um, in the tool, um, paintwork tool. And again, I just painted this, and this has not been set for more than I'm going to say it was five minutes ago that I applied it. And you can see when I rub this, this isn't going anywhere. So on this particular material, I don't necessarily have to heat set it. Uh, if you're applying crystals, which we will be in this project, you will eventually be heat putting iron and iron to it. But I'm just letting you know that, <clears throat> that that's um, uh, just to test before you actually use it. Now I'm just running over here to my cutting table because I wanted to grab these pieces of, I think that these are more vinyls. They're, these do not have the same hand as that beautiful cork piece of fabric. But look, look at, let me back out a bit so you can look. Look at the colors in this. Like these came out, I think these are cut roughly eight, um, eight inches by 12 maybe. But but look look at look at these colors. It's like oh my gosh! I got these off of Amazon. I typed in cork fabric, and if the cork fabric like this was, I'm thinking, this was maybe maybe fourteen dollars or so. It wasn't it wasn't very expensive. It's still very very pretty. But when I when I'm feeling this and I feel the the cork fabric that I just showed you, there is a difference. Not a whole lot, but this I do not think is real cork. I think this is a synthetic. But that being said, it has a really good hand, like I can fold this pretty readily, etc. So in the project it would be uh, very lovely, I'm sure, and I'll use one of these Fabu colors um, maybe for the scalloped trim as we move forward. So that's that part. So here I have the um, the design, the flower, uh, that's going to be painted and sewn uh, as far as the stamens coming out from the center of it and eventually will be crystalled and also appliqued onto the project. And I just wanted to bring you here to show you a couple of things. Uh, again, whenever you bring in a Design Works uh, design, uh, it's important that you remember uh, what foot you're going to be using. Uh, so I'm going to first go into uh, the Sew Out screen. And in the Sew Out screen, it's just telling me to put on my hoop, so I will do that, putting on the hoop here. Yes. And, um, yeah, let's just get through that. And so uh, the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to be stitching out a, um, a basting 
box. Now, I actually made that basting box in the software. You could, if you forgot to do that, you know, or didn't do that, you could certainly just come up here and, and make a make a basting marker. So that, that's how we can do it internally on the machine. I don't want to do that because I already have one in there. So let me just go, oh, this is just saying I can baste around the entire hoop versus the design versus no baste. And we're back to the initial one. So that's a three toggle off, baste around the design or second hit, baste around the hoop. Um, so you can certainly do that not in software. I choose, choose to do it in software. One reason why is I can determine what the stitch length is going to be of that basting. Uh, if it's a basting, I believe the machine is not going to stitch it out at a 2.5 millimeter. I designed this at a 4 millimeter uh, stitch length because I don't want to do a lot of needle penetrations through the stabilizer. It does weaken it. Why did I do a basting box? I did the basting box because Although I'm going to spray the hoop uh, and the stabilizer, which is a cutaway that I'm using here, uh, with some 505, or you could use stable stick, for instance, I use the basting box simply to tack down the fabric um, for the um, for the project. Now, I did um, actually cut into that uh, cork fabric that I keep going on about, and so I will eventually have to go through counseling but not today. And so um, let me just kind of come down. So this is the piece of um, cork. It's really pretty uh, that, that I had cut. Uh, and I tested it out with the marker so I don't have to heat seat, heat set it with the, um, with the iron for the uh, Fabrico marker. It works fine. I want to put a basting box here because I didn't want to just cut a big swatch of this fabric to lay into the hoop. So the basting box is going to show me exactly where um, where I need to place this and then um, all will be good. Uh, the other thing that I will uh, share with you is if you um, put in, if you don't know how big to cut your square, all you have to do is, let me just come back up to the screen, is you can certainly look in software and it'll tell you how big the square is, but if I go back into the editing view, do you see down here in the lower corner, this is a four by four inch basting box. So I cut my uh, cork fabric four inches uh, square, of course. Um, the other thing that I would recommend is just to kind of give you an idea of how this design processes or progresses. When I'm in this, like for instance, I know the first thing that I'm going to be doing is um, stitching. So I need foot 26 for that. So I need to come up here and tell the machine that I'm going to actually have See how that's big highlighted foot 26. That's the way we want to go. Great for embroidery, great for free motion, yes. So I want to make sure I tell this uh, machine which foot I have on. If you don't, and it says that you have like foot 43 on, which was what we did to cut out the crystal template, it'll stop you. It'll say, no, I'm not recognizing this foot. So you won't stitch with that per se. Uh, I also want to make sure that I tell the machine what plate I have on. I have the uh, single hole stitch or the cut work plate on. Um, and that's generally with all crystal work, cut work, paint work is the plate that you're going to be using in Design Works in essence. But I want to come down uh, here to the lower right and um, just touch the, um, the sew screen because this is going to teach me what feet I need to have ready. So the first one is thread. I can see there's a spool of thread there. The second one, this is a paint symbol. So I know I need my foot 97 out. Uh, so that'll be coming up next. I'll keep that in my back of my head. Notice that here where it says foot 26, now you get this red caution thing because it realizes that foot 26 is not appropriate for what you want to do. The next uh, thing I need to do is, uh, again, painting the outline. Generally, when I fill things like leaves, flowers, petals, etc., or lettering for that matter, I will oftentimes, uh, after it does the fill, I'll oftentimes make a painted outline around the object, which just gives the object a more finished look. And then um, the last is back to thread. How do I know it's thread? See the spool of thread? And uh, I'll just go ahead and stitch that out. So it's foot, um, it's foot 26, foot 97, 
foot 26. Sounds like a combination to a locker. And then what do I have to do? I have to go to cut work. So you see how this is teaching me what feet I need. And so cut work is now going to be my foot 44C, something along that lines, the echo quilting foot. So I'll need to make sure I have that ready as well. And then this will go through all four cutting positions. So that in essence is, um, is what's happening here. I'm going to go back to the very beginning. So this is the basting box. And the reason why I brought you back here is I just want to remind you uh, how to bring up your thread if you are doing things like um, basting boxes, things like quilting, where you don't want the bobbin thread just to hang out loose or, uh, God forbid, it doesn't pick up. So I'm going to move this camera a bit because I'm about three feet away from the machine, which could be interesting, and we don't want to do that. Uh, and so let me let me kind of back out just a bit. Yeah, something like this. And so when I'm going to do a basting box, what I will do is uh, I'm going to actually grab my thread from the threader. It kind of held that nicely for me. And I'm just sewing in a blue thread only because it gives me... Um, I don't know, something to, um, uh, for contrast for the filming. Hey, speaking of threads, when I do the, um, the stitching in the flower, um, this, I just want to show you some differences. This is kind of regular 40 weight thread. Let me zoom in just a bit. So this is 40 weight thread. And uh, this is by Wonderfill. It's called Spaghetti. And this, oh my gosh, look at, look how luscious, oh my god. So this is size, size 12 weight. This is the thickest you can use uh, in a needle. And I will probably go to a, um, like a top stitch needle with this, like a 9, size 90, size 100 roundabouts for this nice thick, you know, presence. I want it to go, kind of give me some texture as well as that color. Uh, just because I always want to know, uh, I'm going to back out here just a bit. And I'm going to come away this way because I want to grab the package here so you see what I was talking about. So it's called, it's Wonderfill. Uh, and I actually got this from Gail Patrice's website. I love Gail. Um, uh, that's her website. You could probably get it from the Wonderfill site as well. I love the collections. I bought two collections uh, from Gail. Uh, she's a great serger instructor. Highly recommend her. She has a lot of YouTube videos. Yes, please. And we did a nice decorative um, uh, stitch class with the uh, serger using this type of collection. So Gail, think highly of you. Keep on rocking, girlfriend. You do great work. Uh, but I did want to show you what I'm going to be using for thread. So back to the subject at hand. Uh, I'm going to come back into the hoop here. And uh, yeah, and so what I'm going to do is um, on your machine, depending if it's a uh, 7 series or an 8 series. Um, my uh, up down button is this guy here. Uh, and so what I want to do is I'm going to just hold on to my thread and I'm going to push the up down button. And what that will do, I'm trying to get my hands out of the way, is it'll take one stitch. Love that. Because now what I can do is look at this. I can grab my bobbin thread. So now I have my bobbin thread. I also have my top thread. And uh, yeah, yeah, yay. Yeah. Hey, you know something else I learned? Um, oh, I wish the name didn't um, escape me right now. Uh, I think it's another another gal. She's a Bernina educator. And you know how sometimes you get these small uh, eyes? It may come to me, um, like the 26 here. And you'll take your thread and you'll do this. You'll try to like get it through the through the little hole. You know, you've done that. I've done that. I could keep trying to do this. But, but Gail showed me something that was like really, really great. And that is you take the foot off the machine. You come and bring the foot over the needle and then you pull the thread through oh my god I'm sorry forget everything else that um, she taught during that lesson that was the take home and I certainly um, uh, I certainly did um, <laughs> write her a comment on the video that that was like a game changer and I've been teaching for many many years but that was like an oh my god moment so I have my both of my threads here, right? And all I'm going to do now is I'm just going to touch the start button and it's just going to stitch this basting box for me. And it's just reminding me that I need to be threaded for embroidery, which I am. And 
so that's just going to give me the placement for uh, my fabric. So I'm going to cut out the camera at this point. I'll come back and uh, show you the paint part of this. So off camera, I went on the internet because it was just bothering me. Um, the fabulous educator is Gail, G-A-Y-L-E, Donahue. She has a, a website, uh, Bernina of Naperville. And uh, she and her husband, uh, Chris, um, are the uh, co-owners. And she's, she's done a lot with Bernina. I've met her a couple of times, and she's a sharp cookie. So um, thank you, Gail, for that. Um, how to get the thread through the little hole in whatever foot you need. So, and it works on all machines, of course. Hey, this is um, the Tsukaniko um, company, the Fabrico markers. Love, 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 love these. I already showed you the pink one that I'm going to be using on our project. Um, what I want to show you, though, is um, the Bernina paintwork tool. Yeah. And so the Bernina paintwork tool, you'll see it's foot 93. I think I said 97 before, but it's 93. And um, what you have here is you have this device that has a guard that also gives us our pen depth for uh, good painting. Um, this little clamp opens and then these little inserts, there's four of them for different girths of pens. Uh, you'll find the one that'll fit best with your pen. These, this works pretty well with the uh, tool. There is a little uh, thumb dial here uh, that you can see on the, um, on the screen, I'm sure. And when this is on your machine, if you push the dial towards the machine, the depth of the pen goes down, it goes deeper. If you pull it this way towards you, then the pen depth comes up. And I always test on a little scrap of fabric before painting on my project because all nibs are different. The flow of the ink can be different, etc. So what I'm going to do is I want to see which of these adapters I need to use for this pen. And so I have this little guy here and I'm going to, this is what, adapter number one. Adapter number one, this is Papa Bear. This is like way too loose. So let's try adapter number, drum roll please. Four is gonna be two. This is, this is like Baby Bear on steroids. I can't even get that in there. So let's try adapter number two. Oh, I'm thinking adapter number two might be it, guys. I think adapter number two. Just because we can and we're here. Uh, adapter number three and again sorry that uh, it's printed in black but there's like a number three right there um, so this yeah this I would have trouble with so I'm thinking we're gonna party with adapter number two and so what I do is I take the adapter and I put it in the technical term for this is the gizmo and then I want to take this and bring it into the down position so I can adjust my pen depth I'm going to bring this on in until, hi Danny, until um, the, uh, that, that was my husband. And I'm not going to edit this out because I am loved and I appreciate my husband, Dennis. Uh, so I'm going to take the, um, the pen and I'm just going to push this until it touches. It touches that, um, that red guard. Then I'm going to take this and I'm going to clamp that closed. And so that will be a pretty good um, beginning point, a beginning point. We're going to go over to the machine next, and uh, I'll show you how uh, this is attached uh, and um, how you adjust it. So I have the um, paintwork pen on the machine, and um, I went ahead forward into the design to right before the cut work part will occur, and that would be the stabilization line. And you're going to see, hopefully, I did it in blue thread, but right here is the stabilization line. Why did I do this? Just to attach, make, I have 505 on this, but I wanted to make sure that I've got a better attachment to the stabilizer. What you see here is just, it's like a, oh gosh, it's a strip of like mailing labels, right? And I just cut them in, uh, like you could put them through your printer, but I oftentimes use them just to try out the pen because I want to make sure the depth is good. Uh, and so I'm going to scooch us back just a bit. You'll recall that, um, that right here is the thumb wheel that we can use to make the pen go deeper or shallower. And all I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the guard away and I'm going to allow this to paint a little bit because I want to see what kind of marking I'm getting. And 
I do want to tell the machine I've got foot 93 on because it's particular, which I can appreciate. And when I did that, notice how the pen jumped up here. Before I was on foot 26, that might have been where the basting had stopped. So wherever the pen is, that's where I'm going to go. And so I'm going to put this now up here and flatten that out. Yeah. And so let's try this again. Oh, look at this is fun. So I'm not going to edit any of this out. So it was, it was actually where it had been before. Maybe when I moved, I told it foot 93 or whatever, it just moved the hoop to make sure it was clearing something. I'm not sure. But this should be where it should be. Isn't it nice that the address label is repositionable? Just saying. Uh, so here we go. Let's, uh, let's do a little bit of painting here. And I got to say, I'm, I'm liking the mark. I really, I really have good results with Fabrico. Uh, love those pens. Uh, so what I'm going to do, let me take you back up to the screen. So that was the sound effects of me moving the camera. So you see here, it looks like a little snake. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch here. And I can take this and I can go back. It looks like I need to go back a certain number of stitches. So I can come here and I can say I want to go back to not necessarily the first stitch because that would take me back to the basting. But let's just say I want to go back, I don't know, like 50 stitches per se. And it'll take you to that part of the design. So I just wanted to show you that that's how you can move forward or back in a design, not necessarily per object, but within that specific object. A better way to get to the very beginning of the paint because it was a new object would be this. I'm going to um, come back into um, my stitch out. Let me just go back into this. So you see here, I went so far back, I was back to the basting box. So all I need to do is I need to go forward by one, and that takes me to the very beginning. In other words, if I started, if say I started doing a little paint stitch out, which you just saw, rather than going to the, the little snake icon, which is this guy here, what I can do is I can just go back a color, forward a color, and then I'm at the beginning of that particular object. And so I'm going to pull this little this little label out of here. Yes, you must come with me. And let's let this paint a little bit and I'll kind of keep you here for a moment so you can kind of see this and then we'll um, we'll stop the camera and come back again. So and I do like to kind of keep an eye on it because again this cork fabric has texture to it that's why it's so pretty uh, and so the texture is kind of an uneven surface and I just want to make sure that I'm having good contact with the pen it looks like it's just doing a lovely job there and we'll just take it from there and I'll come back after this is painted so I here I have the uh, the cutwork toolbox. That's the tool we're going to use next. Just opening it up here to show you what's inside. So you have the um, the multi uh, cutting um, tool here. This I think is the best thing since sliced white bread. It's a very unique uh, uh, system to uh, Bernina. Other companies uh, have cutwork needles such as Janome and Baby Lock. Um, uh, to name just a few, I know uh, Husker Viking and Fof also have it, but they generally work with replaceable blades. So they'll have like four different blades that you would put into the needle bar, whereas this, it's it's one blade and you simply turn the mechanism. So it's a it's a nice situation. There are also two extra blades here. Should you break one, I've been using this tool since 20, 2014, 2015 and uh, I'm on my original blade still. Um, there's like a little Allen wrench back here, which you can use. Uh, there is a port, it is right here, that you stick the Allen wrench in. It's just to the left, excuse me, to the right of the window, uh, like such. You put the Allen wrench there, you turn it lefty-loosey, this will come out. There's only one way you can put this blade in. It's kind of like your sewing machine uh, needle. So there's a flat part to the butt of the, the uh, blade that goes up into the mechanism. So it's pretty uh, foolproof, which I appreciate the engineering on that. So I'm going to go ahead and take you over to the uh, machine now. So here we go. Don't get too dizzy. And here we are up here. 
and I'm going to take you to this screen. And why am I taking you to the screen? Because this is something that I have noticed on my, this is an 880. I don't have my 790 out, um, and your mileage may differ, but um, generally speaking, when, when we're using the, the cutwork tool, not generally, we're always using foot 44C. An interesting aside, when this cutwork tool originally came out, which was before paintwork or crystal work, we were using foot 26 uh, or foot 9, I think the darning foot. Um, for the cutting, uh, but now we're using 44C, which is a good foot. It is also known as an echo quilting foot. I like the uh, the dish shape, shape the large um, um, surface area of the foot, in particular if you're cutting out applique shapes, etc. It helps you ride over priorly cut edges, so it, it's a good foot to uh, use. In fact, your cut work tool will not work without it because it sees the eye that's on the foot. Why I brought you here is you can see here that I have successfully put in the different uh, things that are on my machine. I indicated I have a cut work plate. I have the large oval hoop on the machine and I have foot 44C on. Um, it's I brought you here because what I have done in the past, and then I would start to stitch out, and, and the machine would say, are you sure you've got the right foot on? Notice that if I select up here, which is foot 44C, it's the large icon. Notice that you have a duplicate here. If I go to recommended feet, which is what this icon is for, if I go to recommended feet, what's the recommended foot? 44C. Do you see any others? No. So if you select here, there's no red flag. If you select here, Notice there's like a red caution flag. I don't know why that is because I just simply selected the same foot. If I select it again, the flag goes away. So just be aware that for whatever reason, like if you selected the icon here, 44C, and then you go up here to the large icon, that it gives you a caution flag. And when you go to sew, it'll say, hey, is that the right foot? Just select it again and just be aware that you don't want to see a little red caution symbol up by the foot. So. I have the um, the foot on the machine and the foot and the gizmo and what I want to remind people of is when you are using the cut work tool just like with all needles you need to make sure that your setting screw is played out enough that you can engage this all the way up Bernina does not have a little window where you can see the needle butt up in it as opposed to other companies. So what I do is when I'm putting in a needle or in this gizmo, I play the screw out long uh, out enough that I can take the gizmo and in essence when I'm bringing it up I feel the tap of metal on metal which means that this is fully engaged. Then I go ahead and tighten the screw down. The other thing I make sure is that um, in the window that it is showing one if that is what your design is calling for uh, and general it will be one unless it's not if it's a specific shape that doesn't need position number one but oftentimes when I am using this and it's simply a turn of the gizmo to get it to a different direction um, generally when I'm taking this new out of the case for a new project I'm on blade number four um, because that's the sequence of things so when I put it up here I want to make sure that I am cutting on blade number one if that is called for and I will simply flip this back to where it needs to be while I have you here notice how lovely this 12 weight um, uh, 12 weight wonder fill came out um, again this was the um, wonder fill artist palette uh, and again, I love I love that 12 weight thread. It, it it is lovely. It came out nice. I like the matteness of it. I will tell you that um, I used a hundred top stitch needle on the cork. It came out fine. I also dropped my um, my upper thread tension down um, a whole level. So I think normally in embroidery it's around a 2.75 at least on an 880 uh, and I dropped it down to like a 2.0, 2.25 somewhere around that uh, but a couple of clicks downward so that it's not quite as tight on the thread. Uh, also slow your machine down. Uh, so I just this is like the tortoise and hare. Uh, you do want that slow and steady to win that race. Uh, I do love how this is really, um, if you're seeing this in person, this is really embossed up. It looks really, really nice on that. Very, very good look. So as you can see here, 
on my screen. It is asking me for cut blade number one. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to push the start so you can see the tool being uh, used. And I'm just pushing start here. And then it will continue around. Oh, I'm sorry, I got it on that slow speed from when I was using the 12 weight thread. You don't have to use a cutting blade that quick. In fact, you can just make this go pretty full tilt boogie here. And you can see it's just going to jump around the design uh, to where it, the different positions that need blade position number one. And once it's done that, uh, the machine will stop. It'll ask me to go to position number two. I will turn the disc to position number two, push the start button. It will go kind of into different positions that require number two, then position number three, and you guessed it, position number four, and then the design is uh, complete. And I'll bring it back once that's done. So we're back um, on the cutting table, and I'm just showing you, this is the template that we made of the, um, the flower outline with the centers. Uh, again, I'm going to be using the center one here for our project, but I always like to have a stamp do more than one function. So should I need in the future an, a larger outline of a flower or a smaller outline? I have them. And I could certainly use all three of them in combination to give kind of a, maybe different colors as you're going out uh, along the perimeter. So. Um, that's the stamp that I will be using for the flower. Um, this uh, this is my name, uh, and um, again I um, I appreciate crystals. If I am going to be making things like lettering, I generally will go for the smaller crystals unless I'm doing kind of an outline lettering, where I am just uh, as if you took a pen and just drew the. Uh, like writing your name in cursive, that type of thing, as opposed to something that's filled. The more things are filled, especially when you're trying to define A's and O's and things of that nature, the smaller the crystal, the better. And I think th these were cut at uh, a size 6. You can kind of see if I, if I show them up a little closer, you know, the difference between a size 10 versus a size 6. So the more, the smaller the size, the more pixels you have. If you can think of a television picture or a computer screen, the more pixels, the more defined you can make your images. Of course, the more crystals you'll need to use. So I've got this really long backing board here, so why not make use for it? So I have a couple of little stamps, like I made another small, crisp, uh, small flower. Uh, from the original uh, template as a separate template. And this is the circle for the center of the uh, flower, which I'm going to show you on camera how to make the, um, uh, the crystal transfer. So with this, um, I want to show you, um, first of all, this was our um, flower that we just did. And literally, I took it off the machine and this thing just pretty much fell out. As opposed to fabric, uh, which you might get like a little fray of uh, uh, thread here and there that you might need to snip with a scissor, this cork really cut very smooth. I was very impressed with how, how this did. Um, also consider this, if you're ever doing anything with like spray paint art or stenciling, that sometimes the negative space that you create from like say creating a flower can also be used for other types of projects. So that was the flower that we did. When I do um, make um, crystal transfer tapes, I like to use uh, some, it doesn't have to be clear, uh, but some type of container to contain the crystals. Um, this is uh, by the Silhouette Company. Let me see if I can get one in the package. Here's one in the package. It's called a, um, a pick-me-up. And I like this because it has a fine end here where I can take it and like say flip a crystal and then this there is a substance in here that's kind of like um, I don't know like a silly putty or something like that it's a little tacky and so I could certainly use tweezers but I can also use this end to pick up a crystal and get it out of the way of the transfer tape you'll see what I mean as we work forward I could certainly do on camera the flower uh, but after you kind of see the process, that would get a little tedious. It does take a little while to get the um, 
crystals where they need to be. So I'm going to go ahead. I opted for these um, size 10 topaz colored crystals. Uh, I think they would be very nice with this. And um, there is a little, there's nothing special about this. It's kind of like a foam brush that you would get like at a Home Depot store. <coughs> and um, this is just used to help sprinkle the crystals and distribute them. And what will happen is the crystals um, will oftentimes lay right side up, which is what you want. So I'm going to put a little bit of crystalline in here. Do, 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 do. And then I'm going to take this brush and just kind of spread these little kids around. And when they're when they're like big letters like that, where where I did my name, <coughs> excuse me, allergy season. <clears throat> um, the only way to do it really is with this brush. If it's a small design like this, like this is fairly small, you can kind of see here how the crystals are going where they need to be. And let me kind of zoom in on here just a bit. And get you in the camera. There you are. <clears throat> so this is the glue side up, which we don't want. We want the, the pretty side up. So if I take the sharp end of the stick, you could also use a tweezer, and I'm just going to kind of tilt it. You can kind of see how, like a tiddlywink, I can just kind of uh, flip that so that the glue side is down. Right? And so I'm just kind of sitting here, as opposed to the brush, this is a pretty small stencil, just kind of woman handling these things. Um, you can kind of see some are kind of out of the field, so this is where I can take the, the sticky end and pop that where I need to be. So it's a very handy, handy tool for that. And as you can see, for the little circle here, it didn't take that long. I'm just going to brush the rest of these crystals out of the way, and I'm going to pick up my template. Um, now, <clears throat> with this template, because of the dish, by the way, I can just transfer those easily back into the uh, bag. You don't need to see me do that. So I'm going to take a piece of the little transfer tape. This is the transfer tape. I'm going to back out just a bit. So again, um, this can be reused, which is a good thing. Uh, and so I'm going to just kind of use it in its entirety because I can use it for other things. And so as opposed to cutting out like a little a little um, goober of tape for that. I think that would be a little harder to handle. So I'm just taking this off of the transfer tape. I'm going to take this and just put this on top of the crystals. And then with my finger or a burnishing tool, uh, if it was a larger design, like, like a little wheel type of thing. I don't know if I have one here handy. I'm not seeing one handy. but Or the back of a a tool like such. I just kind of give those like a little love rub. And then what I want to do is I want to be able to take this and peel this off of the tape. And I want to make sure that the crystals adhere to the tape. If they don't, I just simply push it back down and make sure I grab them. And so, as you can see on the tape, I have the crystals where I need to have them. And so, I'm going to go over to the um, the um, I'm saying steam presser, but the uh, iron press, and show you how I transfer these onto the project. Be right back. So, you are uh, in front of right now this this Elna um, heat press. Um, I've had this for many, many years. I love it. Um, the, th the thing about a heat press is it's really good if you're doing uh, block fusing, like say of interfacing, if you're doing garment construction, things like this, it really works well with too. Um, I have it set at um, kind of a wool setting, not the hot cotton setting because this is cork, it's not cotton fabric. Uh, and I'm just going to be as careful as I can with things. Uh, I have a, um, this is a piece of, um, the Teflon sheet, 
and I'm just going to put that on top like such and that's just to protect the iron surface and also if anything uh, was doing something bad it protects um, the project as well and so when you're using a heat press you just bring this down like such and then there's a second arm here and this one is going to um, start to beep in about seven nine seconds and I just go a little bit longer so this is me going just a little bit longer for crystal setting and then I'm going to bring this back up like such and then fortunately that beeping does stop when I take this off I don't want to just remove the um, the transfer tape I want to um, I want to let that cool just a bit and then I'm going to come over here and just lift this up just a tad get that off here just to allow it to cool a little bit more and then what I'm going to do, I don't need to do this on camera, I'm just going to slowly peel this back and I just want to make sure that the crystals stay put but that's kind of lovely, ooh, very lovely so I brought you back into the process because I did want to at least record a little bit of me using the cut work tool to, um, to make the trim that will go alongside the zipper. This is the scallop trim that we created in our lesson uh, together. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm cutting both strips of um, trim as, um, in one hooping. And so when I made my little basting box, it told me that it was uh, 8 inches by, by 2 inches. I stitched the um, placement box, as you could imagine, um, did the 505 uh, spray adhesive, <coughs> then went ahead and did my my tack down line for the um, for the faux core uh, co excuse me faux cork which you're seeing here and now I'm just going ahead and cutting this out. All the positions for blade one I'll go through blades two and four and I don't think this is entertaining or educational at this point to see this part of this uh, but we'll bring you back shortly so here we have the parts to the uh, project um, I just took the uh, hoop off of the machine and popped these two pieces of trim off and you saw uh, me stitch that a little bit I really do appreciate how nicely that cut work tool cuts the trims but I'll need two uh, pieces of scallop for either side of the zipper and you're also going to want to have um, let's get the hoop out of the way here you're going to have um, for this particular project not the one that Debbie did on her video you look at the supply list for Debbie's project but you're going to need um, uh, eight inch square pieces of external fabric I'm using this uh, faux cork so there's two eight inch squares and then two lining pieces those these are two lining pieces also cut at eight inches square this is the blinged flower that we did with the crystals it is looking lovely and I'm looking forward to putting that on the um, project this is a zipper that I cut to uh, gosh approximately let's just say 11 inches 11 or 12 inches um, we generally want to make the zipper longer than the project so that we can pull the zipper out of the way when we're constructing um, the project. Uh, how I did that, how I got this particular zipper, you can certainly buy them in the store at uh, 12 inches is not an uncommon length to find but if you needed something like a 4 inch or say a 16 inch wouldn't it be nice to uh, to make a zipper? Yes and that's what this product is. It's by uh, Sullivan's um, Sullivan's International. I've used this product for many years. They come in different colors. <clears throat> they come with, I believe it's what, 12, 12 zipper pulls. And what you do is you slide all of these puppies up along this to give yourself enough, <clears throat> enough tape, right? And then you make sure you leave one zipper pull on because otherwise you just have tape. Uh, and then what you'll do is you'll cut the zipper to the length you want and then you'll put this back on the roll like such 
and then that'll be good for another project of course and you can get several zippers as you could imagine off of this roll so that that's a nice prod product um, so <clears throat> what we're going to be doing next is uh, going through some of the assembly uh, of the project I will tell you that the um, that the first step is of course um, you're going to want to sew a, um, a zipper stop on this side of the tape and I'm going to do this stuff off camera um, I think um, zipper stop off this side of the tape this we're going to leave open until I am ready to finish stitching off the project but in essence what we're doing is we're going to be taking the um, the project let me just get a external and an internal piece and I'm going to zoom out just a bit just to make sure you guys can see yeah and so what I do is I take my my external piece of the fabric I will put that make sure that the zipper pull is of course out of the way but not off and you put that right sides together so here's the zipper pull here's the right side of the fabric here's the tape and then you're going to take a piece of backing fabric or liner I should say and the liner is going to go on the other side of this unit so all of this is going to be matched up you will then go ahead and stitch your um, your quarter inch uh, down like such this will eventually be flipped open like such and then top stitched down now before I do all of that what I want to do and I'll show you this in the hoop is I'm going to take this and I'm going to applique down my piece of scallop trim I might do it actually this way yes this way and then also applique down my flower I would find that to be easier than to do this step after you have the zipper installed but you know step one of the installation we're going to go back under the hoop and we'll go over how we're putting these elements onto one of the external pieces of the project so I brought you uh, back on screen uh, not necessarily to show you how to do applique because that's not really what the lesson is about um, I'm sure you folks have done it before um, but I wanted to show you a couple of considerations here if you're doing this project the first thing I would suggest is I would probably have put the crystals on the flower last as opposed to um, putting the crystals on and then appliquing them simply because the blanket stitch uh, in certain parts of the design like up and through here it may be getting a little too close to my picks going in uh, you can certainly make your applique if you're using a blanket stitch which I'm doing in this case you could make the um, the applique um, picks a little bit smaller I think I originally designed this at um, 2.5 and that was just too small for getting enough bite so they're at 4.2 millimeters now and it's it's doing a, a good job as as you can see it's just getting up into this area here it might be a little precarious and so a couple of things I don't want to do is well first of all I'm going to slow down the machine absolutely the second thing is do you see how I have number 15 um, foot this is a darning foot I like this foot as opposed to the foot uh, 26 uh, let me just grab foot 26 so that you guys know what I'm speaking on uh, this is foot 26 this is like your teardrop foot uh, I don't have as much visual underneath what's happening with the needle I have a better view with foot 26 as you can see here um, I also like it because it's rounded uh, it kind of comes you know up it's not flat so when this is stitching the last thing I want to do is have the foot come in and like knock a crystal off or what have you because it's too low a couple of things you can do to hedge your bets with this the first thing we do this all the time when we do stump work which is a, a different software um, it's version 9 Bernina uh, but what I do is I have my foot control hooked up to the um, the machine and the thing I appreciate about Bernina as opposed to um, a lot of the other machines is the other machines when you're doing embroidery it's pretty much a start stop function so you'd push the start button on your machine with the Bernina uh, I'm not going to push the start button what I'm doing is I'm putting down my foot control and when I put down my foot control you can see I'm taking stitches I can stop it at any moment I can just take a quick uh, on off to see where that needles going 
you can kind of see how I have a lot more control over this. So when I, in stump work, I'm inserting wires uh, under the embroidery. And so you could see where if I'm inserting wires, I kind of need this control. So again, my hands are here. I'm not touching any button, but my right foot is partying on that, on that strip. And so you can kind of see like here, like you see how close these crystals are? So I'm gonna take my hand wheel and say, yes, mama, that's, that's good. Let's come over here. And then I'm gonna just take my hand wheel once again and oh my God, so close. Ooh, look at that. Look at that, guys. Oh yeah. I took my hand wheel. I didn't even let the machine take that stitch. So this is how I would do that. Uh, I would just, um, just uh, go slow if you're having the crystals on. But I did want to bring you back just so you could see this. The other thing uh, I can do is I can tell the machine, because this is fairly thick, this is not just a layer of um, uh, cotton fabric in the hoop, is it? It's, it's, this, um, it's this fake cork, so you can see that's fairly thick. And then I've got real cork, everyone go ooh, real cork on top. So that's, that's causing a little bit of girth here. So let me take you up to the screen girth and um and so i'm going to take this up here and let me back out just a bit back out just a bit and so what i want to just remind you you guys probably know this but it's okay i'm going to go ahead under settings and under settings i'm going to go under embroidery and under embroidery do you see this it looks like um like a roll of batting or what have you um when I click here, do you see how I can tell the machine? The default's generally four millimeters. I'm at 7.5, I could go up to 10. It helps the foot ride higher on the fabric. When you're doing, say, uh, thick batted quilting, et cetera, you don't wanna be at four millimeters. You may be a little bit higher up, so the foot raise or foot rides on the project a little higher. So I have mine set at 7.5 and it seems to be pretty happy with that. And so uh, I'm going to continue to stitch this out um, and um, we'll be back. So here are some pictures of just how I assemble my version of the project. You're going to see that there is the um, the zipper, the green zipper that we had cut, the external fabric which is the uh, cork with the um, applique scallop trim and the flower peeking underneath the backing fabric which is sitting on top the deer and the Celtic symbol. I also have uh, to the right of all this some wonder clips which are great for um, not pinning into things and particularly with cork, leather, uh, plastics, etc. Uh, if you pin into it you're going to leave holes and so those wonder clips are really fabulous for that. So in this next picture, what you're seeing happening is I'm laying the um, the zipper face down on top of the right side of the external fabric, which is the cork. And then what I will be doing afterwards is putting this um, piece of lining fabric right side down. So the two right sides of the lining and the exterior fabric are facing one another. And this is lined up with the edge of the zipper tape. And that is way too small. So here you have a picture of the elements all um, put in the correct order. And um, I'm ready to take this to the sewing machine after clipping everything into place. So you'll see here, this is the stitching line. Um, and everything uh, came out uh, pretty well with that. Um, for this type of um, stitching, of course, I'm going to be using the, uh, the zipper foot. Uh, and I think there's a slide somewhere later where I talk about the different feet. But uh, the zipper foot is good for getting close to the coils of the, uh, of the zipper. And uh, here what you're seeing is I have uh, pressed and um, folded both the external fabric and underneath here is the lining fabric. They are facing now right sides together away from the zipper. And then you'll see along here that I did a top stitch along the uh, edge of the uh, project. Um, I think the stitching stitch length was around a four. So you're going to generally lengthen out your stitch for top stitching. And then here you see I did the exact same thing, but now for the opposite side of the project. So again, it was laying on the opposite side of the tape, the um, project exterior to the lining right sides are together, press, fold it to the other side, top stitch down the line. 
And here is just the same project. It's just showing you the back side of it. So here is the uh, lining fabric and, of course, the zipper uh, looking at it from the posterior or the uh, reverse side. These are the feet that I used in the project. Uh, I like the D feet um, because they have the dual feet opening in the back, each of these. So this foot here, of course, is your zipper foot. Um, I also um, appreciate um, when you have, the, have these screws back here, this is for a, um, a measuring bar. It's an optional accessory that slides uh, through the back of the foot. Uh, do get in the habit of uh, taking these uh, little screws and righty tidying them uh, periodically because they will over time work loose and sometime you'll take a foot out and this little um, tightening screw for the measuring device is absent. Um, this is your 10D foot. It has the center blade in it, again, with the dual feed. I love this foot for, again, top stitching. Uh, so I can deflect the needle or move the needle to the left or right of the blade, depending on what side of the project I am uh, working on. And I get just beautiful top stitching or edge stitching. It's uh, a great foot to have in your arsenal. This is foot uh, 8D, otherwise known, I think, as a coordinate uh, foot. Uh, the reason why I used this um, is because... From the needle to the um, outside of the foot, it's a quarter of an inch either side. To the inside of the toe here, you're looking at one-eighth of an inch just so for your edification. Um, again, a dual feed. Why did I use this as opposed to the quarter-inch piecing foot, which is the 97D? Because although this is a quarter inch here, true enough, it has a wider um, platform on the foot to the left of the needle, which is great when you're piecing. So you're, you're going to be getting better drive with the feed teeth underneath, and I love it for piecing uh, quilts together, uh, the tops at least. Um, but that being said, when you're working on project where you've got a lot of layers and thicknesses, etc., I like the smaller uh, footprint. You could also use... Um, Oh gosh, don't quote me on this, but off the top of my head, it's like foot 53 or so. It was the quarter inch foot that was originally for like your 5.5 millimeter machines, uh, which is a smaller profile. You can absolutely use that uh, on a 7 or 9 series machine with the 9 millimeter stitch width. The issue is that the feed box is wider, and so this type of foot doesn't articulate as well as a foot that is designed for a 9 millimeter machine. So uh, what we're seeing here now <clears throat> is I went ahead and uh, clipped the, um, the lining fabrics and the exterior fabrics together. And I'm going to be stitching a quarter an inch seam allowance on either side of this. And so once that's done, you've got like these two tubes. This is the lining fabric here. This is the exterior fabric here. Um, here's your zipper teeth, of course. And with this, what you're going to want to do is to sew the, um, you're, you're folding the, at the, uh, at the zipper, you're folding the lining pieces towards the uh, exterior fabric. And then I finger pressed open the seam allowance, both on the zipper, excuse me, both on the lining side, as well as on the exterior fabric with those little wonder clips. Um, take note that depending on um, what you have going on with your exterior fabric, that this seam that you're stitching here is going to be the foot of the bag. It's going to be what's going to be laying flat on the table, whereas the other side you'll see in a moment is going to be the top part of the bag. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind because these sides are not sewn symmetric. You'll see in a minute. So again, I'm just showing you that I sewed the quarter inch uh, seam allowance. It's, it's what I just showed you on the reverse side with the uh, lining fabric. You'll see that I finger pressed the cork. Uh, it's faux cork. It's like a, a vinyl. Um, it, 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 it presses relatively okay, but you don't want to use a cotton setting on vinyl. Um, I also back tacked um, a couple of times along where the zipper uh, was going to be to have my zipper stop secure and I cut off the excess of the zipper at that time. Here you're seeing the opposite side of the project and that's what I mean that the sewing is done asymmetrically. So in this case instead of putting the um, 
the exterior fabric to the lining fabric, we put the exterior folding it in half, the exterior to the interior. And here's your zipper sticking out here. And you're going to be stitching your quarter inch seam right along here. But pay attention to this area here. Do you see how there's no, no wonder clips here? It's to remind me that I need to keep this open in order to be able to turn the project right side out. So this is just showing that the the sewing is complete. Uh, you'll see the stitching along here. The excess zipper is uh, cut away. You're going to see my fingers inserted inside the project, just demonstrating that there is an opening here for me to turn the project right side out. Uh, this is um, a consideration, especially with vinyl, that you really want to get the excess uh, fabric out of the corners. Um, it just helps you get a little sharper um, turn when you're turning the project right side out. This is me beginning to birth the baby. Um, this, we're taking that in, or the, ex, um, the inverted fabric and bringing it out through the opening to bring it right side out. Patience is a virtue here. And um, what you're seeing here is the opening where um, I turned this out. I'm going to actually, uh, and I think in this picture it's showing it, I, I just stitched the opening uh, closed with like that uh, number eight foot. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the lining, so no one sees that, which is good. But it just, it's just to seal the lining. Uh, point turners are your friends. Uh, don't don't use scissors with this, but you guys probably know that by now in your sewing career. And you can see by using these um, uh, turning tools, uh, this I think was a Floriani tool. Uh, it has two ball ends, one larger than the other. It's a nice tool. It's, it's made out of metal. It feels solid. But you can see I've, I've got pretty good uh, corners here on this project. And this is just showing the project complete. Um, so this is the, the base that sits on there, your zippers zipped down, etc. Had I to do the project over again, I would have put that first edge on the opposite side, which would flip this the other way so that the base would be here and the flower would be at the top. But that's, you know, that's neither here nor there. You'll just be um, cognate of that as far as orienting the bag. And that is the project complete.